Good morning. Happy to be here at church? Yeah, it's the Lord's Day. You should be happy. Welcome to Faith Community Church. Uh, we're finishing up uh, uh, the third part of uh, Tony's series on uh, the Lord's Prayer in uh, John 17. Um, we're looking forward to that a little bit later. On the edge of every row is a friendship register. We'd like you to take a moment and fill out a record of your attendance and then pass it to your neighbor who's next to you so they can fill that out. If there's a prayer request on your heart, please mark that down. We have a whole church full of people who pray for those prayer requests, and we'd like to pray for that. As you're entering or exiting, we have on the walls our offering boxes, and we invite you to give your tithes and your offerings to those uh, in the offering box, or do that online as well. This week is Vacation Bible School Week. Woo! We've been looking forward to this. Uh, we have a lot of people wearing these blue shirts. Maybe you're working in Vacation Bible School and you didn't get the memo to wear it today. So... If you didn't, you're, that's okay. But if you're working in Vacation Bible School in any capacity, I'm going to ask you to please stand. Would you stand at this moment? All right, good. We're not going to give you an applause. We'll do that next week uh, after we see how Bible School went. But I want, you to, I want you to stand so we can commit you to the Lord. So would you pray with me for all the workers of Vacation Bible School? Father, we come before you giving you praise. We look forward every year to this one week in August where many boys and girls come into our facilities to hear about Jesus. Lord, I pray for each worker. First, that the love of Jesus Christ would radiate through their lives to the boys and girls. In word, in deed, may they represent Jesus Christ. Secondly, bring a lot of children here. A lot of children especially who need to know about Jesus, that they would hear the word of God, they would hear the gospel message, and that they would, through the power of the Spirit who's convicting them of their need of a Savior, that they would trust in Jesus Christ this week. We pray for a great harvest of souls because of our vacation Bible school. Lord, keep us, each one of the workers, healthy. May they not miss out at all with regard to vacation Bible school. And now, Lord, we pray for the weather. We pray that we'd have great weather for the kids to come. And most of all, may Jesus Christ be magnified throughout the week. So, Lord, we commit this week to you. May everything be done during this week. Give glory to Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. I'm privileged to introduce our lead worship leader today, Keith Miller. When we came in 1996, what grade were you in? I don't know. Uh, middle school. Right? Middle school. He was in our youth ministry when Cheryl and I first came to Faith Evangelical. What, no, Faith Free. I forget the name of the church. Faith Free. Keith was in our youth ministry. And when we played games, you want to be on his team in dodgeball. You did not want to be opposed to him in dodgeball. He had a wicked uh, fastball. But now he's becoming a worship pastor at his church in Winchester, Indiana. And he's been learning from Greg, his younger brother, all month about what it means to be a worship pastor. So he's going back, actually they're leaving today after this service, to be worship pastor and discipleship pastor. And so I'm going to turn the service over to you. Yeah, it's, it's been a, an absolute blessing and an honor to get to worship with you uh, this last month and uh, to get to spend time with Greg and just kind of seeing some of the things that, that he makes sure to uh, give attention to, even when there's a lightning storm. And, uh, but I've been joking. I, I, I really wish I could. I just want to be like my little brother Greg when I grow up. Um, he does such a great job, and uh, it's been a blessing to, to shadow him. And one of the things we did this month was, was to go through this book. It's, it's called The Worship Pastor, and it really just encourages worship leaders um, to be mindful of their role as a pastor. And uh, one thing that he, he touched on, when it came to gathering together to worship, um, he, he said this, when we gather to worship, we're about to step into a moving stream. Heavenly worship is happening now. It is unceasing and perpetual. Day and night, they never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come, Revelation 4.8. When we begin to worship as a gathered community each week, we aren't starting from scratch. We're jumping into heaven's praise on the third verse of the song. And I just want to remind you this morning that as we stand to worship, 
we're joining in with all of heaven, all of creation, and millions of believers across the globe today as well as we stand to, to worship God and praise him for who he is. So if you're able, I'd invite you to stand and, and worship with us this morning.
watch and pray find in me thine all in all Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he
Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all of found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? Let's praise him. ascribe to you more glory than what you do. We can't even add to your glory. We can only ascribe to it and point to it and worship you for it. God, we thank you for giving us the gift of your son 
that we can have a relationship with you, that we can know you, that we can come together and worship you along with all of heaven and all of earth. We love you. God, we continue to worship now as we surrender our hearts to you at the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Is that a cool song or what? It's like a like an anthem. You could you could sing that like twenty times over in the round. Just keep going, keep going. Well, it's great to be here with you this morning again, and uh, to open God's Word. And uh, yes, Pastor Bob was mentioning Keith and talking about Keith Miller, and uh, I have a couple of Miller stories too, but they're all good. I remember when uh, I first got hired some years ago, and uh, I don't remember if it was a wedding or some special event, and Keith was singing, and I'm like, wow, he's got some pipes. He was doing, like, some special music or something, and then I met his mom, and I heard his mom sing, and I thought, she had a great voice. Then I met his sister, Amber, and then I thought, she's got a great voice. Then finally I met Greg, and I'm like, he's got a great voice. So <laughs> I thought about taking this thing on the road and being their manager, you know, <laughs> something, something, something. Then I got busy with other things. I don't know. Anyway, we are uh, in the middle of a series called Favorite Accounts of Jesus from the Gospels. I still haven't memorized that yet. Favorite Accounts of Jesus from the Gospels. Pastor Bob was gracious enough to allow us, uh, Jason and I, to pick our own topics of the parables or the teachings of Jesus. So I chose uh, John chapter 17, if you haven't been here uh, in the last couple weeks or for whatever reason, but... We're looking at the last six verses, if you open your Bibles, to John chapter 17. This is the last part of a prayer that the Apostle John recorded. Um, I always wonder how that works, because uh, sometime later, after John hears Jesus praying, uh, the Holy Spirit brings back to his mind, just like the writers of of Scripture, and they write it down, but he recorded Jesus praying to his Father, Right before they were going to go to the cross, Jesus is going to the cross. And um, the first week, you recall, we looked at the first five verses where Jesus is praying for himself. Last week, Jesus was praying for the 11 apostles. And then now Jesus expands this to praying for believers all over the world. So let's look at verse 20 as we wrap up um, this mini-series and a bigger series. Verse 20, John 17 says, Jesus says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, Yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have made your name known to them, and will make it known, so that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. Let's pray together. Father, we're so thankful that you allowed us to read this prayer, to study this prayer, that you've included this prayer in your holy word, so that we can study it and read it. We thank you for the blessings that we have received already, just looking, slowing down a little bit and looking more deeply into this prayer that your son prayed to you. And now, Lord, as um, we look at these final verses, we ask for your blessing uh, because we want to know you more so we can glorify you more and love you more and serve you in a greater way. So clear our minds, help us to not think about anything outside of these doors and just speak to our hearts 
in your son's name, amen. Well, as we looked at the context of what is happening before Jesus prayed this prayer, we, um, things make a lot more clearer sense as to why Jesus was praying. You remember in chapters 13 through 16, it was the upper room, the Passover, the Last Supper, right before Jesus is going to go to the cross. The apostles find themselves in this difficult situation. They've been with Jesus for three years. He's been their teacher, their provider, their comforter, their protector, their friend. And he's been telling them that he's going to leave and he's going away. So you can imagine uh, they're confused and troubled and sad and what is going on? Why, where is he going? They already asked him that. And it's a, it's a time for them that's very difficult. And in theory, when they hear him pray this prayer, it's going to comfort them, encourage them, give them strength. But that's not really going to happen right away because the drama is just beginning. Jesus is after praying this prayer, is on his way to the Garden of Gethsemane. And we see how the disciples are already failing in different ways. They're falling asleep when Jesus is asking them to pray, and, and they can't stay awake. Uh, here comes Judas with the guards, ready to arrest Jesus, and they all scatter. Jesus now is going to be interrogated in these mock trials by the Jews and the Romans throughout the night. And... Uh, Peter denies that he even knows Jesus three times. So they hear this prayer, but it's not going to be until later, until they're really strengthened by the words that Jesus said. But for us this morning, we can be strengthened because we already know the whole story. We're learning more facts about our Savior by the way that he prays. We're learning about his heart. We're learning about his purpose, uh, which affects every one of us in this room. We're learning about how much he cares for us, which, which helps us to trust him more, and it strengthens our faith. So I want to keep the same proposition as we've been doing the last three weeks, that when we understand how Jesus prays, it's going to strengthen our faith. Now, in these last six verses of Jesus' prayer, we gain even more information to the heart of Jesus as he prays for all believers uh, he's looking to the future, believers right now getting saved, believers that will be saved until he finally comes back and, and takes us all to heaven. And notice the first thing that he prays for is unity, the unity of believers. Verse 20, I do not ask on behalf of these alone. You recall in the context of what he was just praying for the 11, he's praying that they have joy, the apostles, that they're sanctified, that they're guarded from Satan, the evil one. So he says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, the 11, but for those, all believers, also who will believe in me through their word. So he's already looking forward. These 11 apostles are going to be the foundation of the new church, the church. Acts chapter 2, Pentecost, and the church is formed, and the gospel is going to go through all ends of the earth. So he's looking into the future and praying for, for us and anyone who gets saved. He goes on in verse 21, he says, That they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us. Right there, you see this unity and uh, how incredible that he's praying for future believers to be unified because he knows the difficulties, the things that are going to be happening in the world. That's why he was praying for protection from Satan and his attacks because he knows what's going to come at us, his 11 and us, even today. Notice two times, verse 21 and 22, that they may all be one, verse 21, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you. Verse 22, same beginning of the phrase, that they may be one, just as we are one. It's almost like a mother or a father who is caring for their family, and they're, they want harmony, they want peace. In your family unit, who wants their kids to be fighting and disobeying and arguing all the time? He wants unity among his disciples, his followers. And then he gets more specific in verse 23. He says that they may be perfected in unity. This word perfect appears in different places in the scripture. It doesn't mean perfect like sinless. It means maturing, growing, 
completing, that's what he's praying for, this process that we're going to continue to be unified and have unity as his followers. So for now, the unity is a process, it's an ongoing process, but someday when we're with Jesus, it's going to be complete. We're going to be in heaven, no more sin, and we will all be physically together with Jesus, totally unified, which will be an awesome thing. Now in the Trinity, we see example of perfect unity. And Jesus wants this to be modeled in us today. And it's important to understand that there's two different aspects of this unity. One is a positional type of unity, sort of a one-time thing, um, things that we possess. And the other is a practical unity, things that we must do. So let's look first at the positional unity of believers. Here we look to other places in scripture to figure this out or to look at things that we have in common that we're unified over. We learn in uh, Ephesians that we're one body, one church, the body of Christ, the called out ones from this demonically influenced system that we talked about last week from the world, called out many parts to the body, but one body, Jesus, one Lord, one head, we have this in common, one spirit, the Holy Spirit living inside of each one who has trusted Christ as their Savior. We have one hope, not I hope I go to heaven or I hope I make it. It's something that you're looking forward to, something that you're expecting. Hoping is something you can trust that is going to happen. You're going to heaven and spend eternity with Jesus. We have one faith. Jude 3 says a faith which once for all was handed down to the saints or the believers. One baptism we have in common Two aspects, a spiritual side, a physical side. The spiritual side is the word baptism means to be immersed. So we're immersed spiritually into the body of Christ, invisible. We don't see it happening, but it, it happens when we trust Christ as Savior. We see the immersion when we have water baptism and proclaim that we're believers and we want the world to know that we're following Christ. We're immersed into the water Picturing our sins being buried, we raise to a new life and tell the whole world that we love Jesus and we're following Jesus. So two aspects of the one baptism we share. And then finally, one God and one Father. All these positional things that we possess as believers. And we see these examples in different parts of Scripture. This is positional unity. But there's four uh, areas in this prayer that we see the Father and Son having unity over or with or in. They're united in their motives. You remember that first week we looked at how they glorify each other. They have a motivation to love each other in the Godhead and, and, and to glorify each other. They give each other things. They're united in their mission. They want to see lost sinners saved. They want to see believers growing in their faith, maturing in their faith. They're united in that mission. The Father and the Son are united in truth, wanting the word to be proclaimed. We saw that last week that the, the apostles heard and understood and obeyed the teachings of Jesus. They, they finally got it. They understood that he was the Messiah. And then the Father and the Son are united in holiness. In verse 11, Jesus calls his Father, Holy Father. And here in verse 25, he says he calls him Righteous Father, concerned with sanctifying, us being made holy, being set apart for God's purposes. We looked at that a little bit last week. So we have a positional unity, the things we possess, but there's also a practical unity, the things that we do, the practical unity of believers. Now think about this for a second. God is in heaven, the, the Trinity is there, they're perfect, they're perfectly united, and they have a goal that they want to, us to, to do what they're doing up there. You look back to the Garden of Eden, everything was perfect. Remember what happened with Adam and Eve? They took of the fruit, and then from that point, everything was messed up. From that point, every child that was born had a sin nature. The perfection was gone. They were cast out of the garden. So the whole Bible is all about the redemption of sinners, that we could be brought back to this perfect relationship, this perfect place. But in the meantime, the Trinity wants something to be practiced, to be mirrored, to be imitated, to be reflected, and that's the things that they have in common. Holiness, 
uh, seeing people be saved, growing in our faith, all these things. And I think a great example of this is church plants. Great example of something originating in heaven and wanting to be lived out is church plants. Many uh, uh, mega churches, bigger churches, plant churches in other place and, uh, places. And what that means is they take their statement of faith, they take their philosophy of ministry, how they do church, how they do worship, uh, how they're going to function, and they transplant that in another town or city. That's a great picture of what the Trinity wants to happen through the church. They want uh, to be happening physically and visibly in us and through us, the same thing that they're thinking, the, the same orders, the marching orders that they have in the Trinity. So all churches are, are to be an extension of what's happening in heaven. We are to be unified together as believers and the motive that the Trinity has, the Father and Son glorifying each other. We want to be glorifying God with our lives. We're unified in the mission of sending and making disciples. We support our missionaries and um, we have mission reports from time to time, and we have that same united mission as the Trinity has, and we're working that out physically and visibly. We're united in the truth of God's word. Pastor Bob has been preaching for years and years, years and years faithfully God's word. We're united in that. We're just like the Apostle Paul. We don't want false teaching. We want to hold true to God's word. And how many times that Paul had written against uh, the purity of God's word being tainted, don't add anything to it, don't take anything away from it, fighting and defending the truth of God's word. We have the same, hopefully the same desire and concern for holiness. We are concerned for holiness in our personal lives and in the life of the church, just like the Trinity and the Father and Son. We have the same mind as Christ, the same love, the same purposes. So we're living out the unity that's already there in heaven through the earth. And one of the institutions, I think, that is one of the best ways to see this is through the family. I mean, think about our culture today. If you see a godly family, hopefully yours is one, not perfect, but godly, trying to live according to God's word, how different and contrasted it is to what's going on in the world today. What a great way to reflect what's happening in heaven to have a husband and wife who love each other, love God's word, are training their children in the ways of the Lord, and you see that extension of what's happening in heaven being lived out through the family. It's a tremendous thing because I remember when I was first saved, the one thing I, I, I couldn't believe was how people could look at me or look at other believers, and you wouldn't even have to say anything, but sometimes you could just pick up that there's something different about the person just because they're born again. I mean... I, would, I didn't think I was doing anything spectacular. I wasn't walking around, you know, praise, praise Jesus and, and talking biblical language. My point is, is that sometimes people could just look at your family and you don't even have to be saying anything and they could just tell that there's something different and that something different is you're reflecting the goals, the values, and the purposes of what's happening in heaven visibly. Not perfectly, but we're all on that road and that journey of trying to do that. So our job as parents, moms, and dads is to try to promote this unity in our home. We want our kids to be disciplined. We want them to reflect what we believe. And when they come to Sunday school, we want them to be well-behaved. Same, same principle, things that are being extended or lived out, peace and joy and holiness and loving relationships with the same goals and the same purpose. Think about the difference between God's kingdom and the, and the devil's kingdom. Total Polar opposites. God wants love and unity and peace, order and harmony, family and in the church and society and the world. And Satan's the exact opposite. He wants hatred, disunity, strife, disorder, chaos, and hostility. So when we're reflecting the principles of heaven, we're totally going to look different than the world. And that's what the goal is, to be different from this demonically worldly system and to be contrasted to it, reflecting the values and the goals of heaven and of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is praying for the unity that he has with the Father to be lived out on earth. He also loves unbelievers. Um, he wants the unity among believers to lead to our second point, is the salvation of unbelievers, the salvation of unbelievers. Now, I love this prayer 
and I, some of the things I just caught this week as I was studying, different things kind of pop out as, as you're digging into the word. You, you guys know that. Verse 9, you remember Jesus says, I ask or I pray on their behalf, the apostles, and I do not ask on behalf of the world. So we understand that Jesus is not praying for the world in this prayer. He's praying for believers, as we've been saying. But in the midst of the prayer, these things kind of peek out. You see his mercy that he's still concerned for the lost, uh, still concerned for unbelievers. Notice in verse 21 and 23, we see a repeated phrase, but there's two different words that separate these phrases. Verse 21, he says, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Speaking about he wants unbelievers to be saved. Verse 23, so that the world may know that you sent me. So let's look briefly first at verse 20 and how God reaches unbelievers. He's God reaches unbelievers through divine persuasion. Divine persuasion coming down from heaven. The word believed here in the original means simply to be persuaded and come to trust through divine persuasion. In other words, God gives us the gift of faith. He's the one that's pursuing us. And you've heard that term wooing. Uh, you know, you're in your dating years and you're trying to woo your girlfriend. You're buying her little gifts and calling her and telling her she's great. And you're wooing her. You're romancing her. God divinely is trying to persuade unbelievers to be saved. And um, all of us can share different ways that God was pursuing us and how we came to know Christ. Uh, maybe it was through a trial or a difficulty or a health issue. And um, maybe there was... Um, you were a little kid and you went to Sunday school. I've heard this testimony a lot of times that somebody heard about hell or eternal life and they didn't want to, they didn't, they wanted to go to heaven and sort of that healthy fear led them to Christ and they raised their hand and received Jesus as their savior. Some of us heard sermons on the radio or uh, somebody testified about their own life, whatever it might be, God was persuading us to come to Christ wooing us that we might be saved. And I love these verses in, uh, or this verse in Romans 10, 14. It says, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? This is not a paid pastor or staff person or professional pastor. Preacher simply means to herald or pro proclaim, to speak the word of God. It's not even rattling off Bible verses. It's just living out your Christian life, getting in conversations with people at work or at school and just talking about your testimony, talking about your life, talking about your church, talking about your family. And through those conversations, you could be heralding or proclaiming the message. How did you come to know Christ? And hopefully the Lord opens up those doors where you can talk to them even more and plant seeds. So... God wants us to speak and to live in such a way that unbelievers are reached. And he wants to pers persuade people to trust in his son for the forgiveness of their sins. But he often does this through personal experiences of people. God reaches unbelievers through personal experience. Verse 23 has a different word, as we said. That's the word to know. Jesus says, so that the world may know that you sent me. This word know in the original means to come to realize or to learn about something, especially through experience. So we have the believing, the divine persuading, and we have the personal experience of how the Lord is drawing unbelievers to himself. This is why personal and testimonies are so awesome. And it's not only, um, hey, can you give your testimony in church on Sunday for 15 minutes where someone comes up and you interview them? But it's your, like I said, it's living out your life. It's your personal temp, uh, testimony. Sometimes speaking and proclaiming, sometimes just living it out, and people can pick up on that. But it's personal experiences. Um, next week, we're going on our men's retreat uh, next Saturday, and three different guys are going to give their testimonies. And you never know what the Lord's going to do. I, you're never sure. I mean, is every single person coming to the retreat born again? Are they saved? Who knows? So you never know what God is going to do when somebody's giving their testimony. So you could pray for that if, if you'd like to. We have, we have some teaching times. We're going to do church out in, the, out in the woods there. So it's going to be kind of a cool time. But testimonies, personal experiences. 
So God wants to reach unbelievers. There's a divine part. He uses a, the human part, persuading unbelievers to come to Christ. But also, he reaches unbelievers through corporate relationships. When you think about it, this whole prayer, there's groups all in this prayer. There's the Father, the Son, and the Trinity. We've been talking about that small group, both small and large. There's the 11 apostles are being mentioned. Unbelievers, the world is being mentioned so many times. And then uh, also believers all through the world. So there's groups of people. We see pronouns, the these and those and them and us and all. This whole prayer is talking about groups. And we see a contrast with groups in this prayer. Jesus says, O righteous Father, verse, verse 25, although the world has not known you, then the contrast, yet I have known you, and these have known you sent me. A contrast between the world, unbelievers, and, and these, the 11 apostles who are going to be the beginning of the church, as, as we mentioned. So these groups, the church, the family, are supernaturally empowered uh, to reach unbelievers and to show the world, what true unity and love is all about. Now, I was thinking about the opposite of this. Uh, many of you are old enough to remember the 60s, back in the hippie movement and all that. I was kind of a young little tyke. I was only five or six, but <laughs> so I didn't. But you remember when the Beatles came? And uh, they're doing this, all you need is love. You know, the whole... The whole hippie thing, right? Everybody's peace signs and flower child. And I got to thinking about that. that. That's the world's way to promote unity and love. It wasn't from God. Most of those people were doing LSD and sleeping around and doing all kinds of stuff that are certainly not from heaven. And I got to thinking, like, no wonder they were all peaceful. They're all high. You know, they're doing drugs and <laughs> sitting around. Hey, man, peace. But, you know the opposite of what is coming from heaven and what, what God wants to be lived out. Man's attempt at unity and, and harmony and love, you know. So real love and unity comes from heaven. It comes to and through believers, uh, making up these corporate groups, the family, the church, and then the church and the family, modeling that unity and love and the Trinity, reaching unbelievers. So when we understand what Jesus is praying about, that's going to strengthen our faith. We're, we're looking at the unity of believers, the salvation of unbelievers. But number three, we see something else in this prayer, the glorification of believers. Verse 24, notice. Jesus says, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory, which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. You see, when all things on earth are finally finished and that last person gets saved and Jesus is going to come back for his children and in the rapture and then eventually the second coming, we're going to go to heaven and be with him where he is in perfect glory and perfect peace. We're going to have new bodies. And that's what this word glorification means. It's a big Bible word, but this is the simplest definition I ever heard, which is easy to remember. It's God's Final removal of sin from the life of the saints or believers or Christians. All the same word. We're saints if we are believers. It's sin. It's the final removal of all sin. That's when we actually go to heaven. There's not going to be any sin in us. There's not going to be any sin around us. We're going to be with Jesus face to face in heaven, in a perfect place. This is glorification. And I love the way that the Bible speaks about this journey. Pastor Bob has mentioned this over the years many times. There's this kind of three-part phase, past, present, and future of our salvation. We are saved from the penalty of sin. That's past tense. Whenever that was with you, you trusted Christ as Savior. Then there's the present tense of the sanctification that we looked at last week, setting apart, making us holy. This is an ongoing journey that lasts through our whole life. We're not perfect yet, but we're, we're, on the, we're on the way, we're on the road. But then there's the future tense of what we're talking about, this glorification. When we finally get to heaven and our bodies are perfect and we're with Jesus. So what I thought was amazing about this prayer, those three things are right in this prayer. 
you recall we meant and we, we looked at Jesus giving us eternal life and the security that he provides. That's the salvation. Last week we looked at the sanctification, and now here the glorification is mentioned. So he's praying our whole spiritual life, our whole journey, right in this one prayer as he's talking to the Father. Now, have you ever bought like a really cool gift for somebody and you like you couldn't wait for them to open it? And maybe um, Maybe it's like when your kids are small, you buy them a new bike, you know, their first bike or something. Or I was thinking about when my wife and I got married or engaged. And um, by the way, number 30 is coming up next year. Praise God. <laughs> but anyway, I remember, so I'm ready to propose, right? And I, so I go to the jewelry store, and I pick out this ring, and I'm like, I'm looking at these big rocks over here, and they're a little too big and out of my price range. So I move over here. And I finally find this ring that's really pretty sharp looking. And, uh, you know, I buy it and wrap it up in a little box. And, man, I'm protecting this thing. You better, you better have a gun if you want to get this from me because <laughs> I don't want to drop it. I don't want to lose it. But, like, in my heart, I'm waiting. Oh, I can't wait for the day that I propose and she sees this ring, you know. So, long story short, that's how I think it is for Jesus when he's saying, I, I want them to be with me. He can't wait for us to come home. So we're physically with him. Think of what he said. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. All the things that we've been reading about, all of our Christian lives, the promises, the blessings, all the things that are up there that we haven't seen yet, it's like opening that gift. He wants us to be up there so we see these cool things that he prepared for us. But it's not only the stuff, it's him. He says to see his glory. He loves us so much that he can't wait for us to, to get there, to see the things that he's provided, but also to see him. Um, I think about his glory. We see in scripture that it kind of peaks out when he was on the earth. Like, um, I don't know, I was thinking about the illustration of, you know, you, you, the sun is shining and you got the drapes closed or your blinds closed, but the sun is just kind of peeking through the sides and maybe it's like hitting the TV screen or hitting you in the eye and, you, you know, that's how Jesus' glory was kind of just peeking out. It wasn't the full sun, the full glory. We see this in Scripture. Jesus rises from the dead, Matthew 28, verses 3, and it says, As his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. Matthew 17, 2, Peter, James, and John are on the high mountain and the transfiguration, and it says, He was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun. And his garments became as white as light. Not, oh, I bleached my uh, white clothes with bleach. This is like, it's glowing. His face is like the sun. His clothes are just bright light. So his glory is just peeking through in different places when he's on earth. And then finally, a picture when he's in heaven, Revelation 1. You know these verses. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching down to his feet. Girded across his chest was a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were burnished bronze when it has been made to glow. So his, his face is glowing. His feet are glowing. His voice is like the sound of many waters. Hard to picture what that sounds like, but incredible. In his right hand, he, he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and here it is again. His face was like the sun shining in its, all its strength. Incredible. We read later in Revelation that there's not going to be any sun, S-U-N, in heaven, because the S-O-N will be there. His glory is going to light up heaven. I mean, is that awesome? I, I can't even get my mind around it. But that's the glory that he's saying, Father, I want them to be with me. He's protecting us. He's, well, first, he's saving us, growing us, protecting us, leading us, and guaranteeing. Remember, we talked about being sealed in the Holy Spirit. Guaranteeing that we're going to go to heaven and see his glory in all its fullness. Incredible. So the Apostle John, this, this is cool. The Apostle John, the same one that's in the upper room, he's laying on Jesus' bosom. It's like... They're reclining in the upper room, Last Supper. He's laying on, you know, they're like really intimate friends, and he's laying up against his bosom as Jesus is talking and teaching. That same John, the same John that went up to the mountain and saw his glory peeking out, the same one who's listening to this prayer 
and writing it down later, the same John who wrote in the book of Revelation, the verses that we just read about the glory of Jesus, he says in verse 17 of Revelation 1, when I saw him in glory, I fell at his feet like a dead man. Whew, that's incredible. This intimate relationship that he had while Jesus was on the earth, the suffering ser uh, servant, the man, God-man, now is in his full glory, and he sees this, and he falls on his face like a dead man. That's the glory that we're talking about. That's the glory that we're going to see. That's the promises that are given to us. Doesn't that excite you? The same one who was mocked and spit at and beaten, scourged on his back, nailed to a cross, that same one wants us to come home to be with him. It's incredible. I love this quote by John MacArthur. He says, it's not difficult to understand that believers, it's not difficult to understand believers wanting to be with Jesus. That's simple. We want to be with Jesus, right? Go to heaven. But it staggers the mind to think that Jesus wants to be with us. <laughs> That's not necessarily to put you down, but it's the realities. We all know our different sins and struggles and battles and uh, that we don't like ourselves sometimes. We want to be more like Christ. We know all the stuff that goes on in our heart. It staggers the mind to think that he wants to be with us. Think about the fact that God is love, that his very nature is to love, that's why he created us. He had love in, in heaven. There was the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit with this perfect unity and love. But he's a creator, creator of God, and his nature is love. So what does he want to do? He wants to create something cool to love it, to love us. That's what he does. He creates the world and he creates us. And even though... Adam and Eve sin, and we sin. He provides Jesus to die on a cross for our sins. And you see how this big picture, the whole Bible, comes a little bit clearer, even as we see what's going on in this prayer. So we've covered a lot of ground in the last three weeks. We've gotten a, a behind-the-scenes look at the relationship between the Father and the Son, how they glorify each other, how they love each other. Uh, we saw that we are given as a gift to the Son from the Father. We're the bride of Christ, believers, and he's the groom, and someday we're going to this marriage supper of the Lamb. We saw the relationship between the disciples or the apostles and Jesus, how much he loved them as he was with them. We see how he prayed that we would be guarded and they would be guarded from Satan's attacks and how much he wanted to protect us. We see how he desires us to be holy and set apart and to walk in holiness. We see his mission and purpose, how he wants us to go out and make disciples, and, and all of these things we see in this prayer. Now, I'm not sure if you, if you thought about this, but 2,000 years ago, he praised this prayer, right? But the things that are happening in your life today are actually answers to the prayer that he prayed 2,000 years ago. Think about it. Every time you share your faith with someone, no matter how, it, in what form, these prayers that he prayed is being answered. Every time you say no to sin and have a victory against the enemy, this prayer is being answered. He was protect, praying that you would be protected from the evil one, growing in holiness. Every time you apologize to a brother or sister in the church, maybe you have a beef with somebody, Every time you're reconciled with them in a relationship, answer to this prayer, living out in holiness. Every time you serve him and glorify his name in whatever way in the church, answers to this prayer. So the very prayer that he was praying 2,000 years ago, <laughs> some of the answers are happening right in our life. Isn't that incredible? And he's eternal. He's God. So he's praying, and he's praying blessings into the future 2,000 years later. So... What an incredible prayer. When we understand how Jesus prays, it's going to strengthen our faith. Amen? Strengthens our faith. It makes me want to serve him more. It makes me want to praise him more. It makes me want to love him more when I see what really happened in this prayer. Let's pray together. Father, we give you praise and honor and glory, and we thank you for all the truths that we have learned. We, we said at the beginning, Lord, that we know that the more we dive into this prayer as many, many godly men over the years have testified that the, more, the deeper we go, the more things we learn, and it's, it's like inexhaustible. 
we thank you for allowing us to see deeper into the prayer of your son to you. We thank you that you included it in the scripture so we could read it and study it. And we praise you for the things that we've learned. I, I pray that whatever we've learned would be translated into deeds, fruit, works that you would get glory from. And I pray that you would strengthen our church, our families, us personally as a result of some of the things that we've learned. We see how much you love us and you care for us, and we just praise you. There's nothing more that we can do is just praise you. In your name, amen. I invite you to stand with us as we worship once again and just glorify God for, for how marvelous and how wonderful he is. See? 
blessing and a privilege and honor to get to worship this morning with you, along with all of heaven and all of earth. Be blessed this week in the power of the Holy Spirit. Fulfill the Lord's prayer for us. In Jesus' name we pray and we go about our week. Amen. You are loved.